In the last video, we talked about how Eratosthenes of Cyrene measured the diameter of the Earth. Now we move on to the next great achievement of ancient Greek astronomers, who managed to measure the distance from the Earth to the Moon. Well, we walk on the Earth, it's right here under our feet. But the Moon is up in the sky, and you can't reach it with your hand or a measuring stick. However, to measure the distance to it, you need to compare that distance with the diameter of the Earth or with some kind of measurement taken on Earth. So how did they do it? It turns out that the ancient Greeks came up with not just one, but three ways to measure the distance from the Earth to the Moon. The first of these methods was invented by Aristarchus of Samos, who is primarily known for proposing the heliocentric system, meaning a model of the universe where the Sun is at the center, not the Earth, many centuries before Copernicus. Aristarchus's method is based on observing lunar eclipses, specifically how the Moon enters the Earth's shadow, and we will follow Aristarchus's path and calculate the distance from the Earth to the Moon based on this method. Let's take a photo of a lunar eclipse in its partial phase and overlay a circle on it so that it fits the edge of the Earth's shadow well. Now let's draw a circle around the full Moon and compare the sizes of these circles. We found that the diameter of the Earth's shadow is 2.5 times larger than the diameter of the Moon. This part of the measurements was the most challenging because we could compare the sizes of the Moon and the Earth's shadow in a photograph. But ancient astronomers didn't have that option. They had to make their comparisons directly in the sky, observing the eclipse with the naked eye. It's clear that you can't achieve great accuracy using this method. However, they had another way to find the size of the Earth's shadow in relation to the size of the Moon. And let's take a look at that method as well. Let this black circle represent the edge of the Earth's shadow, and this yellow circle represents the Moon. And let's be lucky that this time the Moon, in its movement across the sky, passes through the center of the Earth's shadow, or somewhere close to it. And I'll also mark a point on the lunar disk that first enters the Earth's shadow. Now let's understand the phases that the eclipse goes through. The first phase, the Moon is entering the Earth's shadow, and when the leading edge reaches this mark, the partial phase turns into the total phase. Then the Moon passes through the Earth's shadow. This is the second phase. Right now the eclipse is total, and then it exits the Earth's shadow. This is the third phase of the eclipse. It's clear that the first and third phases last the same amount of time, and I'll denote that time as T1. And I'll denote the time of the total phase as T2. And it turns out that T2 is about one and a half times longer than T1. And from this, it follows that the diameter of the Earth's shadow is 2.5 times larger than the diameter of the lunar disk, just like in our first estimate. The next step in our reasoning takes into account the fact that the sizes of the Earth's shadow at the location of the Moon during the eclipse are somewhat smaller than the size of the Earth itself. And this is because the size of the Earth, in turn, is much smaller than the size of the Sun. Let's see where this leads us. I've depicted the Earth here, and the Sun is located somewhere very far away. And it's very large compared to the Earth, which is why the Earth's shadow has the shape of a cone. And from this area, the Sun is not visible at all. Somewhere inside this area during the eclipse is the Moon, and the width of the Earth's shadow at this point is 2.5 times larger than the diameter of the Moon. The question is, how much has the Earth's shadow narrowed down to this point? Here, a very convenient fact helps us. During a total solar eclipse, the Moon perfectly covers the Sun, and the Moon's shadow on the Earth's surface just collapses into a point. And this means that if here, the lunar shadow has decreased by the diameter of the Moon, then here the Earth's shadow has decreased by the same distance, the diameter of the Moon. So, the diameter of the Earth is 3.5 times larger than the diameter of the Moon. So, if we know the diameter of the Earth, which Grattisfen measured, and here's a link to the previous video, then we also know the diameter of the Moon. It's 3.5 times smaller than the diameter of the Earth. Now we need to find the distance from the Earth to the Moon. And for that, 
We'll measure the angular size of the moon in the sky. And they are measured with this simple tool. This is a long rod with a diopter mounted at the end. A bar with a hole that has a diameter of one millimeter. It serves as a sight and forms the apex of the visual cone. This is important because the pupil of the eye expands significantly in the dark. A cylinder with a diameter of 14 mm moves along the rod, which will cover the moon. The observation itself is of course done at night, and it's carried out like this. The rod is aimed at the moon, and then the cylinder is pulled by a string to the eye until it completely covers the lunar disk. In our experiment, this happened when the distance from the eye to the cylinder was 160 semetermit. Let's do the calculation using a proportion. The distance from the Earth to the Moon relates to the diameter of the Moon, just like the distance from the eye to the cylinder relates to the diameter of the cylinder. 1600 mm divided by 14 mm equals 114. We find that the distance to the Moon, based on our data, is 114 times the diameter of the Moon. If we measure in Earth diameters, we need to divide 114 by 3.5. We find that this distance is equal to 33 Earth diameters. And modern accurate data says that the average distance from the Earth to the Moon is 30 Earth diameters. So we were only a little off in our measurements. And by the way, in our previous discussions, we assumed that the size of the Earth is much smaller than the size of the Sun. But how did the ancient Greeks find this out? Based on what available observations could they have come to this conclusion? Share your thoughts on this in the comments for this video on YouTube.